Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to On the Edge. Time now to go to Massachusetts and speak with Dmitry Orlov, author of both The Collapse Gap and Reinventing Collapse. Dmitry's website is cluborlov.blogspot.com. Dmitry, welcome to On the Edge. Always great to be with you, Max. Okay, Dmitry Orlov, your latest piece on your website suggests Americans and Europeans worship fortune. How's that working out for them? Well, not very well. Um, gambling works really well when you have a lot of uh, resources to squander, but when they start running short, then everybody begins to lose. And gamblers find it dissatisfying when it seems to, to them that the game is, is rigged against them, which is what's happening now. They don't know what else to do, though. If you look at what people are doing with their retirement savings, for instance, they're still gambling, and um, they're not going to stop until they run out of money or until their mindset changes, and I'm not even sure which will happen first. Okay, now, Dimitri, in your essay, Collapse Gap, you compare the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the United States. Uh, you make some comparisons there that they both overspended on military hardware, uh, but there's a gap between the collapse uh, that the U.S. is now collapsing, uh, as uh, the Soviet Union has already collapsed. But in the U.S., of course, the model has been to take on more units of, jet, of debt to produce a unit of GDP. So 20 years ago, they took on one unit of debt to create two units of GDP. Uh, now, or, um, now they have to take on five or six units of debt to, to create the same GDP. In, in, in the Soviet Union, however, it wasn't debt-fueled per se, was it? Or have I got, is that a, not a fair statement? Well, at the very end, it really... Uh, hinged on the ability to uh, to borrow from the West in 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 the last stages when basically when the Soviet system was basically in agony, um, Gorbachev was trying to uh, um, get Helmut Kohl to intercede with the Americans to get some money from the Americans to keep the Kremlin running. Um, it was down to that. Okay, so can we make a comparison then with the United States is begging China for credit? to keep its empire going? I think that the, it's going to be a, a much bigger crack up in case of the United States where the entire system fails, whereas the Soviet Union was really uh, looking at the financial, global financial system was in one corner. It, it may be similar in a sense though because um, at some point the United States will lose access to imports, will be unable to finance imports, and that will be quite similar to what happened to the Soviet Union. Now, uh, again, with the Soviet Union and U.S. comparison, uh, you mentioned the word gulag, and you immediately think of Stalinism or Soviet Union and Russian gulags. But in fact, the United States now has the biggest prison population in the world. And combine that with the presence of food stamps instead of real jobs, and you end up with a bit of a gulag there, probably the biggest in the history of the world. Is this also part of the collapse gap, is the proliferation, if you will, of this gulag mentality? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the American government right now is, is uh, very paranoid and becoming more paranoid every day. So, um, and, and it dovetails very nicely into their penchant for spending as much money on security as possible. So it's a self-perpetuating, self-feeding thing. But it's a surveillance state. It's a police society. It, it is rather ineffectual in a lot of ways, uh, squanders a lot of resources on nothing, but it's becoming more invasive every day. A lot of people are talking about leaving, whether they're leaving or, or not, I'm not sure, but a lot of people are thinking that this is going in the wrong direction and um, don't want to have much to do with it. Now, in the U.S., of course, there's the Occupy Wall Street movement, there's a growing protest movement, uh, there's uh, bushfires of protest all across the country for different reasons. You had a, almost a coup d'etat in the state of Wisconsin after a Republican governor threw that election. So um, is this um, going to lead to uh, significant reform? I mean, in the, in the Soviet Union, of course, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. You had the, you had the um, emergence of the Russian Federation to take the place of the Soviet Union. Is something similar possible in the United States under the collapse gap timeline and scenario? All of these pro protest movements that are erupting around the planet, not just the United States, are a sign of the times, I suppose. The entire planet is on the verge of a nervous breakdown this year. And, and so we will probably see a lot more of it this year. Now, in terms of what 
it will result in in terms of uh, positive political change? I'm not so sure. It's very hard to see how the situation in the United States will devolve. You see, the Soviet Union was made up of various republics, various countries that uh, went their separate ways, had their own histories, and, and um, once they were free of the Soviet Union, they forged a new future for themselves as separate nations. The United States is basically a bunch of uh, little mini-me states. Each state is uh, a miniature replica of Washington in terms of its, its legal structures, in terms of its governance. So if Washington can't govern, then what, what is to say that the states can do any better on their own? So the crack up here would have to go uh, much further than it did in the Soviet Union, where it's not even clear what kind of political structure would be left to, to pick up the pieces. Right. In your uh, essay, Collapse Gap, you make the the analogy that the uh, Soviet Union effectively fell out of a one-story building, uh, whereas the U.S. is falling out of a 20-story building, given the fact that you still had basic infrastructure of the state was still working, people could get around, and there was still um, energy and food to some degree, uh, whereas in the U.S. you have these exurbs and you have these people, as we saw during the oil spike to 147 uh, back a couple of years ago, people who were stranded in the exurbs were actually incapable of making contact with the outside world and were suffering real, real extreme stress, uh, which would be unique then to the U.S. collapse. Now, one of the things we saw in the collapse of the Soviet Union, the post-collapse, was the rise of the oligarchy uh, under Yeltsin. Uh, and this oligarchy is still very much... Um, you know, and doing powerful things. In the U.S., it seems as though there's an emergence of, a, of an oligarchy as well. I'm thinking of, for example, uh, the uh, Facebook going public. Here you have a 27-year-old kid, Mark Zuckerberg, worth $30 billion. Uh, he's a bit of a test tube oligarch, sprung from the loins of the technocrats. But uh, aside from a few odd oligarchs, the overall playing field, overall economy seems pretty stark. Your thoughts? I think Zuckerberg is a special case, and, and it's, uh, it's something that shows you what the American economy has become. If the mo most highly valued asset right now and among the, the new IPOs is, is basically a, a time waster, which is what Facebook is. It's just something that does what people normally do face-to-face, -face, puts it on the Internet, and wastes a lot of time in addition. But um, I think that countries around the world, the United States and Russia included, have a kleptocracy problem. The Russians are right now battling their own kleptocrats. That's the thing that they don't like most about Putin. Uh, that's why there are lots of people demonstrating in minus 20 degrees Celsius weather uh, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, because they don't like all of this robbery. And I think that these uh, kleptocrats have made a, a, a really bad decision. They, they're long paper. They, they're basically, their wealth is not in anything tangible, but in, in bits and bytes inside computers and in pieces of paper with numbers printed on them. And they will be left quite naked when all of that falls away because it proves to be worthless. Yeah, let's talk about central bank policy for a second uh, and these bitty bits of paper, as you mentioned. The Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, uh, they seem all to be going down the same path towards ZERP, zero interest rate policies. Uh, under the, uh, the chance that uh, somehow this is going to ignite some GDP growth or inflation at some point, even though uh, what they're really doing is they're adding more debt onto the debt pile and hoping that somehow this reduces the debt pile. Can you speak about this a little bit? Well, yes. I, I don't think that it will uh, uh, kickstart growth or, or anything of the sort, but what will, it will do is instead of uh, a phased collapse where we have a financial collapse and you know banks go bankrupt then we later on we have a commercial collapse where there's a shortage of imports and an economic slowdown and depression and then we have a political collapse because the governments can no longer uh, pay for their extravagant needs and so simpler political more local political structures evolve we're not going to go down this uh, kind of created slope. We're going to go down a cliff and all of these collapses will coincide because the system has been rigged to perpetuate the financial system at the expense of everything else for as long as possible. Now, um, of course, people, when they compare Soviet Union to the United States, 
the term price fixing comes up in, in the um, Soviet Union. The price of cars or what have you was fixed, and this was uh, controlled by the state. And this was supposed to create some egalitarian um, industrial uh, harmony. Uh, but we know that that doesn't work. Uh, in the U.S., however, you do find something very insidious over there at the Federal Reserve Bank, similarly in the price-fixing arena. Can you talk about it a little bit, Dmitry Orlov? I'm not sure whether uh, there's really um, you know, grounds for comparison, uh, because in, you know, in the Soviet Union, the, the system was egalitarian because uh, the living arrangement was more or less identical no matter who you were. Um, you still lived in an apartment, you still took public transportation, your children still went to a public school. There weren't any distinctions of that sort uh, based on money. In fact, the money couldn't really be spent in any particularly useful ways. Uh, what we have here is a system where there's everybody else and then a few people at the top who play by a completely separate set of rules. I wouldn't call that price fixing. I would call that fixing the whole system. Well, the price fixing I'm referring to here would be at the Federal Reserve level. They, they fix the price of interest rates. Instead of letting the free market decide the price of interest rates, they have fixed prices, and they are operating as a Politburo, the Federal Open Market Committee, and they are ignoring the tenets of free market capitalism, much to their detriment, because obviously there's no growth, there's no meaningful output, and wages and income are still collapsing. Uh, so um, this is, I think, analogous to what we've seen in dictatorships in the past. We have a monetary dictatorship. Uh, let's, let's, let me ask you about the uh, military uh, in both countries. Of course, um, what you see in the U.S., the military spend is just seemingly increasing. You've got wars in Afghanistan. You just came out of Iraq. There was an invasion of Libya. Now there's a war mongering going on in Iran. Is this sustainable, Dimitri? Well, it's sustainable for the immediate future, but the thing that needs to be understood is, is that um, this uh, military system doesn't actually achieve any objectives. Making uh, Iraq aligned with Iran and Syria was not particularly an objective. Um, making, making it possible for the Taliban to return to power in Afghanistan, which they're about to do, was not an objective. In fact, this military hasn't actually met any objectives in terms of securing the peace since a, in a significant way since about World War II, not in Korea, not in Vietnam. Um, so it's really just a, a gigantic money waster. Uh, the congressmen can't force themselves to, to vote against anything military. Um, and uh, the conflicts are just basically there to, to justify the existence of the military as opposed to uh, protect national security or anything of the sort. So it'll lumber along and eventually run out of money. And America's enemies, if, if any exist as such, are very happy to just basically hang back and, and let the United States destroy itself by spending money on the military. Right. Well, the, uh, it seems uh, the, the methodology of the Wall Street bankers is embraced by all, and they definitely have a, a suicidal bent. So this has permeated the culture uh, at large. Uh, so this is uh, uh, all about resources, of course, and um, the U.S. now, you're in Massachusetts, uh, you know, we've gone through these resource wars. Uh, the U.S. is claiming it, that it's now energy independent due to the uh, fracking and the natural gas that it's finding. What are your thoughts on this? Is this true? Is America now energy independent? No, fracking is uh, a financial play. Uh, all of these companies have been uh, producing at a loss, given, given the prices right now. Um, if the prices were at a level that would make them profitable, the economy would collapse. And furthermore, the reserves, the Marcellus Shale reserves, have been steadily downgraded because the initial ass assessments were ridiculously inflated. I think that this is a, the production is spiking right now, and it's a financial play, and then it's going to crash, and, and that'll be it. Now, again, you're in Massachusetts. How does your you're presumably you're speaking and writing on, on these subjects. How does it play uh, your overall theme in Massachusetts for audiences there? What, what's been the reaction? Actually, uh, people in Massachusetts are, are really busy doing all sorts of things because Massachusetts is the prosperous part of the United States, one of the few islands of prosperity. You know, the, the United States as a whole has been steadily slipping uh, in, in 
along many categories, but uh, Massachusetts is, is very much a, you know, a first world island uh, in this morass of decay. So people here are, are really too absorbed, too, too, too involved in, in what they're doing um, to, to pay attention to me. Let me uh, cut in here for a second. So um, if you um, are saying that they're very absorbed in what they're doing, do they notice this creeping surveillance state? You know, uh, domestically across the U.S. and the U.K., we see rapidly expanding and hostile surveillance state. Of course, the Soviet Union is most associated with the, our surveillance state. Um, but now we see this becoming... Um, really uh, omnipresent uh, everywhere uh, in the states and even in Massachusetts. Do the, do the prosperous folks in Boston and Cambridge uh, mind the fact that the state is now pretty much in, in their face 24-7? Yes, I would say that uh, most of the people uh, that, that are aware of it are extremely annoyed about it and uh, uh, take, take some comfort in the, fa in the fact that you know, the surveillance bureaucracy is quite incompetent. They're incompetent, but, they, uh, but they're annoying. And, of course, uh, it needs to feed that ever-growing population of incarcerated uh, people, which is a huge industry in the United States, is the prison industrial complex. Even in the height of the Soviet Union, was it, it wasn't as bad as we see in the United States now in terms of the need to imprison people for a quick buck. Well, uh, I think that here um, the, the prison industrial complex is is really part of uh, race and class warfare, if you look at the composition of, of, of the inmates. Uh, in Russia, uh, the, 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 the prisoners were, um, um, the prison population was a, a little bit more egalitarian and representative um, of, of society as a whole. In the United States, if you can afford a defense attorney, you're much less likely to, to go to jail. So it's a money-driven system of justice that doesn't dispense justice, it sells it. All right, uh, Dmitry Orlov, let's uh, talk about Europe. Uh, where does Europe fit into the collapse paradigm that you first set out in Collapse Gap? Well, I, I thought that Europe would probably uh, do better than the United States because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more reasonably set up. There is much more public transportation. It's smaller geographically. Uh, there's a lot more use of rail and, and uh, water transport. Um, there's there's uh, natural gas flowing from Russia, which is a mixed blessing, but uh, at least there's quite a bit of gas on the same continent that, that can, be, uh, can, be, can still be exploited. And these are historical nations that have gone through hard times before. Uh, they have gone through uh, many wrenching changes before, whereas the United States is this synthetic entity that was uh, put together in a way that that isn't going to last with all of these suburbs and all of these highways. And uh, it cannot really function without a lot of economic growth, because if it's not growing, it's decaying. So that's what we're seeing now. And once that decay runs its course, it's not even clear what's going to be left here. Um, all right, so give us uh, an overview of where we are on the timeline. You laid out the collapse gap scenario. And we have pretty much stuck to the scenario as you set that out a few years ago. Uh, we're saying pretty much as you predicted, things uh, devolve and collapse uh, in the U.S. and around the world. So where are we on the timeline? What are the, what are the uh, short-term uh, objectives or goals that we should look for and some of the medium-term things that will happen? Well, the essay that I wrote in February of 2008, The Five Stages of Collapse, is still being read a lot, although I've... I've, um, I've, I've published a, a, a slight correction. I thought that the stages of collapse would be spaced in time. So you'd have financial collapse, and then you ha you'd have commercial collapse, and then you'd have political collapse. But thanks to the manipulation of the financial markets, it's now going to be a pileup. They will all three occur at the same time. Well, what do you, <laughs> on that score, uh, I, I noted with interest that in the Chicago futures markets, they will begin to trade politicians like pork bellies on a new prediction market, political futures market. So they're taking the, the worst of the political arena and the worst of Wall Street and combining them into one way for speculators to manipulate markets and throw elections simultaneously. Is this kind of what you're talking about? Well, I, I, you know, I think that's brilliant. And, you know, uh, there's, there is a lot of hypocrisy and this is uh, reducing the amount of hypocrisy. Uh, everybody knows that 
pol the politicians here are for sale. Um, and, and they sell themselves all the time. That's pretty much all they do all day. So uh, having a little bit of transparency to how politicians are bought and sold isn't a bad development. Okay, so in 2012 then, uh, you're looking for a pileup, uh, not so much a distinction between the five stages of collapse. Um, according to the Obama administration and the Democrats of the United States, there's a quote-unquote recovery going on, and the employment number is rosy. NASDAQ is at a 10-year high. The IPO market is hot. Um, is this a uh, sustainable, I would take it you believe this is um, not sustainable. Uh, so what will bring in the, the uh, resume to the, to the trend here? What, what are your thoughts, Dimitri? Well, if, if, the, if the economy consists of uh, selling time wasters and, and, and nothing else, then uh, they may, there may still be a healthy market in time wasters like Facebook and various other toys. Uh, the real economy that uh, feeds clothes and, and houses people is, is decaying, and all of the infrastructure around us is decaying, not improving. The welfare of people is not improving. So you really have to use your imagination a lot to, to think that there's a rosy scenario going on here. So uh, in the decaying infrastructure, would you include the big banks in that? No, because banks are, are basically, you know, these fictional things that, that uh, just basically have paper and, and bytes in a computer. Um, and uh, I'm talking more about uh, things that are a little bit more physical, like the quality of the food that people eat, like um, the sense of insecurity that they have because uh, they don't know where their next paycheck is going to be coming from. Things like that. All right, Dmitry Orlov, thanks for being on The Edge. We'll have you on uh, soon again to check into the Collapse Gap timeline. So far, you've been right on the money. Thanks for being on The Edge. Thank you, Max. And that's going to do it for this edition of On The Edge with me, Max Kaiser, and my guest, Dmitry Orlov. You can find Dmitry Orlov at cluborlov.blogspot.com. You can send me an email at ontheedge at Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.